I start off section 6-5, China and the West, by including a map of Africa during the era of European colonialism, because we can kind of see the, the same story starting to play out. Uh, we saw these seven different European countries more or less carve up different sphere, spheres of influence in Africa, and the same thing is going to happen in China. This section I usually will talk about a lot longer because I had a chance, actually, I tell my students to live in China for one year from 2013 to 2014. And of course, I'm just bringing a high school history teacher's understanding or perspective to it. But I think this section is really, really enlightening, um, especially when we look at the rise of China um, today on the global realm too. So we start off by, again, saying, you know, the why were all these European, later on the United States countries, able to, again, colonize uh, much of the known world, especially in Africa and India and in Asia as well, too? Um, and this goes back to Section 4-1, the Industrial Revolution. Um, life started to increase so rapidly, and there was these changes in technology and medicine and travel and commerce, and it happened. But why did it happen, like, in Great Britain? And why did it spread to just those adjacent European countries, like... There's the fascinating question, why didn't the Industrial Revolution start somewhere else? Why didn't it start um, in China? Why didn't it start in ancient Rome? And the text identified these four features. Natural resources and geography um, played a role in it too, access to materials that could be used to create new inventions. China has a um, three major rivers that um, really bisect the country, the Huang, the Yangtze, and the Pearl in the south, and really fertile land too. Labor and capital, um, again, allowed merchants and inventors to have access to working populations that they could use and that they could utilize um, with their new inventions. Entrepreneurs and inventors, this idea of the Industrial Revolution was a way to challenge the status quo and also a favorable climate for business, which enhanced this competition. There might be something more to it, but this era of rapid change starts in Great Britain and then again spreads to those adjacent countries. You'll see again, um, you know, Britain, France, Germany, Japan is the exception, Russia, these countries are all in Europe um, and they reaped the benefit of the industrial revolution. So again, how was China able to be colonized so rapidly by these six or seven different countries? Well, the industrial revolution happened in one place um, and not the other. So prior to um, 1793, this is just when the Industrial Revolution is starting to really take off. Most people put it around 1750. Um, but China had refused trade with the West. China, um, the actual name, Zhongguo, means Middle Kingdom. Um, there was a belief in China that it was the center of the world and that um, it didn't need to travel beyond its borders to get anything that it actually needed. When you do a deep dive into Chinese history, China wasn't a a conquering um, nation at all, with the exception of the Wan Dynasty. But most Chinese dynasties were really content to stay really within this main China, um, Chinese interior. There was a famous McCartney mission in 1793 in which a, a British guy brought a bunch of um, inventions like a hot air balloon, uh, muskets, and said, we'd like to open up trade. Uh, but the emperor at the time, Emperor Qianlong, said, no, there's nothing that you have that we could possibly want or possess. So if the China wasn't going to open up, um, competitors are going to see China as a market in which to expand. Um, again, this labor and capital, uh, the, there are markets that um, competitors are going to want to tap into. Um, China still in 1800 at this time had one of the largest populations in the world. I believe the largest population, again, due to favorable geographical um, locations too. So um, one of the things earlier on that happened is British merchants at the time recognized the enormous potential to sell and market a drug known as opium um, in southern China, in and around Guangzhou, Macau, and Hong Kong, too. Basically, an, an addictive drug that is smoked. Um, it was outlawed in China. Um, the bureaucrats in, in the Qing dynasty didn't want their population um, addicted to opium, but Britain more or less forced open China um, via the opium wars. This is really a drug cartel war. Um, in which Britain said, if you're not going to open up to us, we're going to basically force you to open up. There was a several instances in which um, British ships were destroyed, and that was used as a causes belly to start a war. And by 1842, it was a, a one-sided affair. China is forced to make what is 
a series of treaties known as the Unequal Treaties. Um, and this really begins in China, basically what is known as the Century of Humiliation, about from 18, really 1849 to 1949, in which China recognized that it had closed itself off to the rest of the world, and now it was paying the consequences. The first treaty was the Treaty of Nanjing, which was signed in 1842. China was forced to pay war reparations to Great Britain. Hong Kong was granted to the British. Um, this has major implications for world history today. Hong Kong was a British enclave um, until I think 1997 was the date that it was officially returned to Great Britain. Don't quote me on the year. I think that's right. Um, but I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but five ports were opened up to Britain and other European countries, and also British citizens were granted extraterritoriality, meaning British citizens living in China were not subject to Chinese rules. They could um, commit crimes, but then they'd be tried in their home country, but it basically um, allowed British citizens or merchants to act with, with force if they needed to. Um, but Hong Kong, just really briefly, because I always try to tell my students, I want to connect, of course, what we study world history to like major events going on in the world today. So Hong Kong for um, a little over 100 years it develops as a British enclave. At first, it was basically a malaria infested marsh. But after that, it was turned into a really, really prosperous city today, one of the most expensive cities in the world to live by. But um, as China became a more communist closed off country beginning in 1949, Hong Kong was granted uh, more freedoms um, that existed within the British rule of law. And um, in 1997, it was returned to China officially, but it's known as this like two party, one country status. And um, I tell students the example, like if I was in China, I couldn't, if I was in, I lived in Yichang right here in kind of central China. If I was there, I couldn't check my Facebook because it was a little more closed off. But if I went to Hong Kong, I could check my Facebook. Um, so there existed in Hong Kong um, more of the freedoms that would be um described by a Western perspective that that was closed off in China. I'm getting a little ahead of myself that China becomes the communist country in 1949. Um, but still to the state, there's a major question. There have been protests really over the last 10 years known as the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. How much is going to be, um, is it going to fall under Beijing's rule or is it going to have, again, some of those more rights that um, sometimes Western nations are more accustomed to. But it was annexed really by the British um, in this war. And, you know, that's a, if we want to understand why there's protests happening in Hong Kong, we can go back to this period of history and at least understand the beginning for why um, Hong Kong had um, really existed for so long with different um, rights. Also at this time, there's something known as the Taiping Rebellion, which really, I don't think in my opinion gets, excuse me, enough, um, attention in history from 1850 to 1864. And it starts off with, again, um, by the 1800s, the Qing dynasty was in decline, which again, comes back to the danger of a single story. Don't let this be your only story of the Chinese dynasties. My freshmen learn about them in ninth grade. We cover the um, earlier Chinese dynasties in sixth and in seventh grade. So they've probably forgotten about Qin Shi Huang and the founding of China, the construction of the Great Wall and his burial in Xi'an with the terracotta warriors. Maybe we forgot about the beautiful writings of Confucius during the Warring States period, the beautiful poetry of the Tang Dynasty, the conquest from the Wang Dynasty. Like these are again, all stories that we need to be cognizant of. But a textbook again says by 1800, the Qing Dynasty was in decline, which is true, but we can't let again, that be the only story. There's more. But Hong Shi Huang, as a result, and I always mess up pronunciations, I apologize. Um, by 1850 in southern China, proclaimed himself actually to be the brother of Jesus Christ. And um, he had come into contact with, with Christian missionaries. And his goal was to establish a heavenly kingdom of peace that merged both Confucian and Christian traditions. So he was challenging the status of the, um, of the Qing dynasty, of basically of rule and order. So there was a rebellion. Hong Shi Huang found major support among disenfranchised Southern peasants and for um, 14 years waged this war in Southern China that um, challenged, again, the Qing dynasty 
the rule of law. They captured Nanjing and it nearly toppled the Qing dynasty, but it was eventually repressed. The estimates are so difficult to project. 20 million casualties, um, accounting in to affect more of the famines that um, and crops that were destroyed as a result. Can we take it up to 100? It's so difficult to tell. Um, but as the Taiping Rebellion is going on, this is just further weakening the Qing dynasty, which is again allowing these imperial powers the opportunity to tap into China's vast resources. So China becomes this country at a crossroads, and it's beginning to recognize that it didn't open up to the ideas of the West. It closed off, and now there were British colonies in the South, German colonies in the North, French colonies over um, Southeast China, Southeast Asia and Vietnam. So there comes this question, China needed to determine how it would adopt certain Western practices, certain um, Western technologies, or otherwise it was going to be, again, this country that would be bullied by other European countries. And there was major conflict over individual choice, which was something and kind of this idea that arose out of the Enlightenment over Confucian values, which stress more the idea of collective unity, collective response. Um, I can't get into a giant philosophy um, lesson because number one, I don't understand it as well, but there's more of like the individual freedom rights that are kind of championed by some of the enlightenment ideas that influenced the West, but that came into conflict with some of the Confucian values, which again, stress more um, collective action together. So China's at this like crossroads, like, like what does the country do? Wealth and Power is a fantastic book that talks about famous Chinese philosophers like Liang Qiqiao and later on, um, in the 1970s and 80s, Deng Xiaoping, like, what does China do? How does China respond to all of this? Um, we have a character, the Dowager Empress Cixi is finally ruling during the later ages of the Qing dynasty. We'll see in just a second how she was very conservative and didn't want to adopt some of the Western practices that later on led to a major conflict. Japan, um, always kind of this rival to many of the the Chinese dynasties beginning, I think 894, China closed itself off, or Japan closed itself off to the, um, the Asian dynasties that exist at the time. But Japan actually kind of embraces the idea of industrial revolution. In part, it was also forced open. Um, and the Matthew Perry in the United States famous fleet that opened up to Japan said, um, you know, you're going to open up and Japan kind of reluctantly did. But Japan had opened itself up many years earlier, and by this time was able to aggressively take more Chinese territory. Korea and Taiwan also fell to the Japanese. So now this historic rival, kind of across um, across the across the, the the ocean here in Japan, is like they are able to um, bully China, and you know that almost again adds into that century of humiliation. Uh, for China. At this time, too, Japan actually, around the same time, defeated a Russian fleet um, in the, uh, oh, it's at the Russo, the, oh, whatever. Um, Japan defeated Russia and actually took territory um, in the north as well, too. So, and here's this kind of this famous peace negotiations. You have, I think this picture is accurate. I'm not sure. You have Japanese diplomats wearing Western attire. And here is the traditional robe worn by the Qing officials. It kind of speaks to how the world was, again, being forced together and being forced open. Continuing with the century of humiliation, roughly speaking from 1841 to 1949, um, this is when China will become a communist country under Mao Zedong on October 1st. But um, it was basically characterized by European aggression um, and colonialism within its territory. So China needs to change. There's a reformer named Guan Chu who launches the 100 Days Reform, which again attempts to put China in a, on track to become more like Western countries. But the rapid change is not accepted um, by all. Ordinary Chinese citizens can't understand how they have to suddenly upend their life and change drastically. So we get to, in 1899, a group of Chinese peasants had formed a secret society known as the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. And... I would need to go back and remember why that was their name. Um, but the Westerners called them the boxers because of the way 
they fought in the martial arts. Here's a picture um, of them down here. But they were unhappy with the, what was happening in the country. You can perhaps understand here's again some political cartoons that shows um, European Japanese powers carving up China. Here's a political cartoon with um, a American, Japanese, and British bulldog forcing China open to trade. So the boxers in 1899 and 1900 um, went on a killing spree across China, killing many foreigners, expelling them, um, and basically trying to start a rebellion that would kick out, again, all the European countries. But by this time, again, if you want to fight back in 1900 against a country that had experienced the Industrial Revolution, you were going to lose. So there was an international coalition of soldiers meant to quell the Boxer Rebellion. We have a, and these aren't, it's not particular, we have a British, we have a German, we have an Italian, we have a American, we have a French soldier, all lined up on here who quell the rebellion. And in 1900, the Boxers were defeated. Um, the Boxers had taken some hostages in Beijing, and, but they were eventually released. And Empress, Empress Dowager Cixi supported the Boxers at first, which cost her um, politically, CC and the Qing dynasty were again further weakened, which brings us into the final conclusion, the consequences of the uprising. Um, it says that um, the defeat forced even the Chinese conservatives to understand that they needed to support westernization in their country. Um, Chinese students at this time were being sent abroad to other countries to study and see what was happening in other parts of the world that had embraced this era of change. One of them was Sun Yat-sen. Um, who is known as the founder of China's first republic. My handwriting is still really bad on this one. I'm buying a new um, stylus, but China begins to develop um, economically. It has, a, as we saw, again, a huge labor force. Um, and eventually, we have Sun Yat-sen, who becomes China's first really re president who of its first republic. He advocated what becomes known as these three principles of reform, known as the three principles of the people, this idea of nationalism, again, a concept really still um, still kind of new in, in Europe, the idea of loyalty to one's country, um, democracy and livelihood. Empress Cixi died in 1908, um, and there was a brief period where a two-year-old boy inherited the throne. But by this point, like the jig was up. Um, we understood in China that they needed to change and alter their society. So by 1911, the Qing dynasty collapsed and Sun Yat-sen returns from the United States where he was studying and later is sworn in as China's first republic. And China will have a period from 1911 um, when it's a nascent early republic to famously 1949 when it will become the communist country um, and will later on then rise to be um, a global world power um, where as we sit in 2023, um, we see the rise of China. We can see... Um, China had a grudge kind of maybe for that hundred years of humiliation. And we'll continue to see um, how China responds because it is certainly a, a powerful country today. Um, and we look back at that history and we can see why maybe perhaps still there is conflict um, between the West and the East.